Hi everyone, welcome to today's PTRC Fireside Chat. Just a quick introduction to PTRC if you haven't heard of us. We are a training company based in the UK, which specializes in the training of transport planners, engineers, designers, and placemakers. We run a conference every year called the Transport Practitioner Meeting. I'm very happy to announce that we've closed the call for papers and the program should be released soon. I'll put further information in that on the chat. Uh, PTRC is part of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, the membership organization for the professionals leading the movement of goods and people. Since April 2020, we've had some amazing and insightful conversations during these fireside chat, and I'm looking forward to today's talk. I'll hand over to Glenn, who will be the chair for the discussion today. Thanks very much, Brogan. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the PTRC fireside chat series and our latest event, number 15. My name is Glenn Lyons and I'm the Mott McDonald Professor of Future Mobility at UWE Bristol in the UK. Thanks ever so much for joining us and I do hope you enjoy the session and please make sure you get involved during the event by using the chat bar to raise issues and questions for us and perhaps amongst yourselves. Today we're gathering to consider the important issue within and beyond the transport sector of how to be our authentic selves in our professional lives, why this matters, what can stand in the way and what we can do about it. This is not easy and there may be some of you listening who are struggling or have struggled with the frustration and distress of not feeling able to be true to yourselves. We have an amazing panel who I know will be sharing with you some thoughtful and inspiring insights into this through their own lived experiences and we'll come to them soon. Developments this week I think have been very pertinent to this topic on Tuesday, the Deputy Minister for Climate Change in the Welsh Government, Lee Waters, announced the outcome of the Wales Roads Review, a world leading step to challenge the orthodoxy of building more road capacity in the face of a climate and nature emergency. As I sat in the Senate, the Welsh Parliament watching on, the challenge to be authentic and true to one's values was palpable in a setting where other politicians were quick to criticise the Deputy Minister. Yesterday, as I suspect most, if not all of you know, Nicola Sturgeon stood down as Scotland's first minister. When I first heard the news, I was immediately drawn to the parallel with Jacinda Ardern, standing down as New Zealand's prime minister. In my book, and this isn't about politics per se, two inspirational and authentic leaders who were true to themselves in the face of the slings and arrows of a difficult political environment. I'd like to read out, actually, if it's OK, a couple of quotes from each of them. First of all, Nicola Sturgeon. Some of the brightest and best women in our society are stifled in their ambitions. Politics is a very male dominated, male driven profession. I was not just a woman, but a young woman. And I suppose you end up trying to behave in a way that you think is expected of you. And from Jacinda Ardern. When you're a bit of an anxious person and you constantly worry about things, there comes a point where certain jobs are just really bad for you. And I don't think that the next generation should fear just being who they are, rather than conforming to an expectation of what they're meant to be. This far side chat is both about the environment we work within, with its culture and people, but also about what the work that we do, or might be expected to do. And before we come to hear from the panel, I'd like to end my opening remarks uh, by doing something a little bit different, which is to read out a contribution to this fireside chat from someone who calls themselves the ethical secret transport planner. They feel strongly about today's topic, but wish to be anonymous in expressing their views. I can say that they're a senior individual within the profession. And here's an abridged version of what they wanted to say to you. There must be very few people who think of themselves as unethical. As a transport planner, my core beliefs are that transport has a role in helping the greater good, economically, socially and environmentally, and that planning should produce better outcomes. However, transport planning in reality involves compromises and trade-offs, but that's OK because we have means to manage these trade-offs, including transport appraisal guidance and consultations that give a voice to the public. Provided we follow the guidance and use the right tools, we should be assured of an ethically optimal outcome. Our only ethical decision is to play our role diligently. Ah, if only it were that so simple. There are always grey areas. 
Let's look at an issue which is currently very much foreground for this transport planner. The evidence around how we achieve net zero transport compels me to believe that radical reduction in car use is urgently needed. However, the guidance and tools do not appear to be guiding us rapidly towards net zero. For this transport planner then, there are two possible moral positions to take. Accept that a slow and steady approach to change is right and that transport planners are part of the checks and balances in moving forwards, or that we must move quickly and transport planners should avoid advocating or facilitating any scheme or strategy which delays achieving net zero at the pace required. I know many transport planners believe the first of these options to be the correct course and that it falls in line with our professional duty. But what challenges does a transport planner face if they truly believe immediate radical actions needed? Should a lifelong highway specialist be expected to refuse to work on road expansion schemes? Regardless of their public embrace of net zero goals, can businesses be expected to forgo the revenue of road schemes? Can local government ignore pressure groups and political opponents who say there is no urgency to change? There are costs and risks for any individual or organisation taking radical unilateral action. However, to not do so will surely clash with personal ethics and many organisations' stated values. This is why I believe for transport planners, the critical questions are no longer technical. The critical issue is ethical. Whether we must now take a hard line on any strategies or projects, we know take us in the wrong direction. Simply put, if we accept the objective science of climate change, can a transport planner morally facilitate road building? So, in a week where orthodoxy of road building has been well and truly challenged and when stepping away has been the right thing to do for a political leader, now let's move to our panel and hear from each of them in turn. Sharon, over to you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I'm really quite interested in what we're going to be talking about today. Um, not least from my own point of view, I think being yourself in a work environment is always difficult. And I think it's generational. Um, I'm of an age where you were sort of brought up with the don't explain, don't complain environment. And it's amazing for me to see younger people being so much confident, more confident than I ever was about who they are and what's important to them. Um, and I think particularly at the start, of certainly my career and also being neurodiverse, trying to work out what normal looked like was really hard. So I do feel like I spent probably the first oh, 20 odd years of my life <laughs> trying to be normal and trying not to be me. Um, and I think it was really difficult because particularly going for job interviews, um, I used to always put makeup on. Now I don't wear makeup. In, apart from very, very rarely, but I felt I had to wear makeup to go to a job interview. And at some point it crossed my mind that actually, if they wouldn't take me for who I was, I probably wouldn't fit in there very well anyway. But it took me a long time to realise that. And the sort of programming, I need a job, I need a job, I need a job, sort of tended to take over. So um, despite my best friend being really infuriated with me, I am happily makeup free apart from the odd evening when I'm out on the town. But it was also, um, I when I, well, around 2000, I had a job at Lotus. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said that. But um, I didn't tell anybody I had a child. I had a two-year-old at the time. And I just generally didn't feel able to tell them, my boss, or my colleagues, really, that I had a child because I thought they'd judge me for it. And sort of having to ask to go even on time to leave the workplace because I had to pick the child up from the childminder was quite difficult and I'm just really happy now that it's much more of an open discussion and I'm really hoping nobody is sitting there in a meeting at any point with me thinking oh my god I've got to go and would be able to come forward but it's really hard and particularly if you're the only at that point younger woman in the room to actually stand up and go I've got to go and everybody look at you you know I felt embarrassed and I felt well I'm you know I'm not doing my job well but I think it's also you know as well as your personal values, it's what you hold true to is important. Um, and it's quite interesting, Alan, on the calls from um, the Somerset Council, I previously worked for the Diocese of Bath and Wells. And you might imagine that that's a very churchy environment, but we, we welcomed absolutely everybody, you know, atheists, um, all different faiths. And I think the point there was, you didn't actually have to be a believer of that faith, but we tried to be welcoming to everybody. And we tried to actually live some of our values in being welcoming. 
But again, it might look really weird from the outside to say, oh, I'm going to go and work for the Church of England or I'm going to go and work for whoever, a charity. Um, so sometimes you've got to sort of go, well, actually, they're nice people. They are going to be responsive, hopefully. And you might be able to find a really good fit, even if it's not 100 percent in line with your beliefs and your values. And on the flip side, you know, people have lives, they have mortgages to pay, they have families to bring up. Doing a job because it pays well is also authentic. You know, I'm not saying everyone has to be on the bread line and living off baked beans on toast. You know, there's all these industries out there. The oil industry, for example, we're, a lot of us are in transport. and We spend half our lives either trying to reduce car emissions or do something differently with them. We need the oil industry. So it's completely, utterly legitimate to go and work for the oil industry if you enjoy it. And paying bills is great. You know, I would much rather be able to meet my mortgage than not meet my mortgage. So being authentic doesn't necessarily have to mean I'm going to be, you know, working for a charity for the rest of my life. Um, so how do you do it? How can you be honest and open about yourself in a job environment? And how do you find that absolutely perfect job? Um, and I think some of it's about when you're looking at job descriptions. If you've got a, a stomach feel or a, a gut feel that says, I'm not sure you're probably right. You don't have to apply for a job just because it's there and just because it looks like a good fit. You know, be it's difficult, particularly if you've got bills to pay, but be brave sometimes and go, no, I don't think that's a good fit. And set your own boundaries. You know, what is a no-go area? What's a red line? What isn't? Um, everyone's got different boundaries. And only you can decide what you'll be comfortable with. Um, so all I'd say there is sort of set your own boundaries. And if you get in a new situation, always try and find something that might be able to guide you through it. I guess, say, getting back to the neurodiversity, trying to work out what the rules are is quite difficult. You know, I usually ask, do we bring birthday cake in? It's a simple enough question. But if you go somewhere where it's a done thing and you don't, or it isn't a done thing and you do, you can feel really strange about it. So try to find that sort of to put the, the holder of the office law who you can talk to to understand. And if you don't enjoy those conversations, possibly email them. There's nothing wrong with asking for it to talk to HR or email with HR in advance, just to try to work out those little niceties that you might not get just by being there. Um, and also, if it's really not working for you, it's not a bad thing. Um, any relationship with people, with friends, with colleagues in the workplace, if it's not working, find a way of getting out. You're not doing anybody and certainly not yourself any favours by staying. So work out what it is that's not working for you and look for that in the other job. And you just accept sometimes things doesn't work, don't work. Life's not like that. And then I think finally, do remember as oldies have been brought up in a completely different environment. And as, as hard as we try to be supportive, we've sort of had it encouraged out of us for a number of years. So we are there, we are willing to talk, but sometimes we might just find it a bit uncomfortable. We might need your help a bit, just coach, coaching us as well to how to have those conversations. So thank you, Glenn. Back to you. That's great. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I've got all sorts of questions already, but I'm going to resist temptation for now and move straight to Lynn. Thank you, Glenn. Actually, um, it made me smile when Sharon said about um, not wearing makeup anymore, um, because um, Many, many years ago, I was working in an organization looking for promotion and it was um, recommended to me that I ought to cut my hair and maybe not be so blonde so I could be taken seriously. And at that point, I decided that um, that really wasn't the organization for me. So um, I want to start with a question really um, for you all. Do you ever feel as if you're wearing a mask? Um, do you think that you have to act a certain way around your boss or say certain things to your colleagues so you'll be expect, accepted? And instead of being yourself, you're playing a role to fit in and impress others. I think many of us have gone through times like this. Instead of behaving in a genuine way, we tell people what they think they want to hear and act in ways that go against our true nature. In short, we're living inauthentically. And in these situations, we do not do our best. Living and working in this way, like I say, it's tiring, it's dispiriting and confining, and it can hold us back from reaching our true potential. And the opposite of this is to live and work authentically. Um, this may sound very philosophical, but it's actually true. 
I started my career in the public sector in the highways and engineering department. And I was the first female graduate engineer in the local council. And the male dominated department was skeptical to say the least. This was over 30 years ago. I felt that there was no point trying to impress as my knowledge in the field was limited to say the least as I had a town and country planning degree. I, the policy I thought was best was to be myself. I listened hard and inquired with an open mind, which was much appreciated and mutual respect developed. On other occasions and in other companies, my authenticity has been challenged. For example, where the environment is very competitive and goals are set, which I don't share. I'm referring to my experience of internal competition in the private sector, where emphasis is often played, placed on who makes the most profit in a region or a team who secures the biggest contract. And you feel that you need to be part of this race, but you actually don't want to be in that race. You want to be in a bigger race that benefits the whole company. And in the past, I've been lucky enough to be in the position of advocating a one company approach where it's recognised that everyone plays their own part in securing success rather than just competing against each other. How we present ourselves is important too. When you are your authentic self, you speak with conviction on your subject and you tend to draw on your core values. And this really helps your credibility. In contrast, I've found it extremely difficult to give evidence at public inquiry when you don't believe in your case, um, but you're instructed to make it nevertheless. I now think very carefully about what public inquiry work I do so I can represent my clients and achieve the best possible outcomes. So five points, I think, on how we can be our authentic self in the workplace. First of all, believe in yourself at whatever stage in your career. You need to believe in yourself. You can't be authentic if you don't believe in yourself and your ability. And you need to express yourself honestly and consistently to the world. Um, pursue your passions. We all do much better when we're passionate about our subjects. My belief is integrating land use and transport planning and getting rid of silos. And I actively look for projects where I can contribute to this because it's achieving my belief. And as, and as Sharon says, you need to set boundaries and walk away from toxic situations. So for example, I was working for a developer who changed their approach to the development halfway through the, the scheme. And I really couldn't defend what was being pursued. So I changed jobs. Um, and lastly, improving how you communicate can have a really big impact on living your authentic life. And practicing assertive communication styles ensures honest, open and dialogue, which still considers the needs of others. I also think that authentic authenticity is about showing respect. It also doesn't give everyone carte blanche to act disrespectfully in the name of self-expression. Instead, it involves being genuine and intentional. And authenticity also provides a foundation for your own effective personal branding. And that actually helps you develop and design your career in a positive and genuine rewarding way. Thanks, Glenn. That's wonderful. Thanks, Lynn. I'm scribbling like mad here. Um, again, more questions, but I'm going to um, be well behaved and, and move us on through the panel. And um, now I come to someone who I can say very personally has helped me to be my authentic self through a big part of my career. Um, Paul, over to you. Hello. It's great to speak to transport planners. I'm not one of you. I come from a very different uh, sector to Tony. And uh, one thing I want to contribute, and if you don't hear anything from me today, is that the worst thing you can do to yourself is not to be true to who you are. I think anyone who is in that state to quickly run away from it, simply because the worst thing you can do to yourself. You know, one thing that I learned very early in life, in year four in primary school, was an incident I want to share with you. Now, in my scripts, 
or them out of my store, we go to school and you come back each evening. So this day, we went to school. I knew, we all knew in year four that this boy fought with this girl, okay? Now the second day in my village, it was a masquerade day and the boy was not at school because his family actually are in charge of the masculine festival. So the, the rest of us were coming from school and this little masquerade was after this little girl that was beaten up the previous night, that pre pre previous school day. And immediately we all knew it was our classmate who didn't come to school, that he was the masquerade. And so we said, okay, we know it's you. Tomorrow we will catch you when you come to school. The following day, you are not supposed to know the identity of masquerade. The following day, he came to school. He was not sick anymore. And when he came to school, we all, you know, dealt with him because he was nasty to the girl. He was, he, I, I pretend that he is the masquerade and he's one of the gods of the village. Now, what I'm saying with this little illustration is that there is a human being behind or within the masquerade. We all masquerade ourselves to work. We all dress up in one way or the other. We all make up, we all speak, when I first came to England, I was to speak Queen's English. So I was mimicking the English accent. So different ways, we all masquerade ourselves. And the masquerading part of us actually overtake us before we come to work. And we all masquerades come to work. So it's masquerades just like in the African village square, you know, playing the festival game. So there is no reality within that. And one thing which I have learned is that for you to be authentic, to be your real self, you have to first know who you are. Are you real self? Are you sincere to yourself? Are you who you say you are? Is your CV what you say you are? Okay, now because in the interplay in the office, there are also many people with masquerades who are playing the same game. And one thing I've learned is that first, this is me. And I can say, oh, that is Glenn. So I want to know the, the Glenn behind the masquerade of Glenn that comes to my office. It used to be in his tie, in his suit, speak nicely until I knew he was raving in some parties all over the world, okay? You see his background, that is Glenn, okay? But never knew that for a number of years. But I tried to ask him, how is your wife? How is your children? How are you doing? In order for me to be able to know the real Glenn. And thank God I know, I know the real Glenn, okay? And to me, I think we need to go into that space to know ourselves and to get off the masculine gear. And that is possible for you, for everyone to be able to do. Know the person that you are talking to. Know their family. Know who they are. Know what makes them fit. Uh, what, 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 what gets them going? And I think it is by us being, you know, building that that the person actually wants to be included, boarded into an inclusive place in which I may be perfect, you may be imperfect, but your imperfection does not disturb my perfection, okay? And I have to understand that despite all my perfection, there are imperfections in me. Everybody's got values, but my value doesn't have to rub off against your own value. We can actually work that carefully through that space 
you know, being able to include the other person. And I think it is when we build that kind of inclusive environment, that is when we actually develop a different culture. And that culture of inclusiveness actually makes money for any company that does it, any transport plane organization that does it, any public organization that does it. You include people, you assign them on the same vision, you are connected, you put together. Fine, it works. And I'm very glad because many companies across the world are able to this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 are knowing this. I will stop for now, but I think uh, we can later on in discussion will continue. Thank you. That's really wonderful. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I think not just for you, but I'm going to press the emotional intelligence button now on my desk because I think you really demonstrated that beautifully. Um, but also the the complexity and the challenge and the the, the conscious effort to to not just be your authentic self, but to re reciprocate in understanding each other um, to create a more authentic and inclusive environment in the workplace uh, and one that can make profit. Um, that that will turn some heads, of course. Um, Hannah, can we come to you next, please? We can. Hello, everyone. Um, um, great point there, Glenn, on uh, one that can turn a profit, which is also really important in business because you can't do business without that. Uh, so my name is Hannah Smart and I am co-director of a, an urban design and master planning practice called Edge Urban Design. So I'm a slight rogue as well. Um, in not being part of the core transport industry, but um, I very much come from the strategic placemaking um, arm. So a little bit about what we do. Um, and I think I'll give you a bit of background as to how I got to where I am today, because I think that's quite important. And perhaps some of those of you in the audience are kind of wondering where you go next in your career. And maybe some of this might help you. So I have worked in lots of traditional um, businesses in London and outside of London and lots of those I found in my career were quite male dominated and um, I'll also say that I am very much the kind of person who comes up with lots of ideas and puts lots of energy into whatever it is that I'm doing um, and so in all of the job roles that I've had I've wanted to bring that and create change and do lots of exciting things and change the world so um I carried on doing that, trying to change the world. And I found in lots of the roles that I had that sometimes that wasn't looked upon favorably. And maybe some people are kind of scared of change, um, especially kind of with younger um, and female um, employees coming in and kind of saying, we should do this, we should do this. I mean, it was a little bit of a jar for some people I've worked with possibly. Um, and I think I got to the point where every time somebody said no to me, I felt like I was um, a sink full of water and someone was pulling out the plug. That kind of draining feeling of I can't express myself and I can't kind of bring my personality to the table. So after um, kind of having that knockback all the time, um, suddenly I think I woke up one day and I stopped caring about what other people thought of me. And for me, that was a real um, kind of changing moment because it gave me the confidence <clears throat> and the bravery to think, well, I'm just going to have to change it up. So um, I have a little bit of a phrase that I always use, and that is that a comfort, a comfort zone is a wonderful place, but nothing ever grows there. And uh, when I kind of got that and I realised I didn't really care what people thought of me anymore, that was my catalyst. Um, I, I was working with um, a friend and the two of us decided to just start a business together. Um, so we made a decision and literally <laughs> within a few days, um, the business was born. So we had chosen to live life on the edge, so to speak, and, um, and, and the business that grew from that was Edge Urban Design. So I want to just show you a couple of slides, if that's okay, <clears throat> which I will share um, just a little bit about Edge and why it's different and what it means. Um, uh, let's put that on full screen. Can you guys still see that? Yeah, that's so, all good, Hannah, we can see yeah. it. Perfect. So we started a business called Edge. Um, the reason that we did that is because we wanted to create something that was completely different, completely fresh, with the complete opposite of everything that existed so far. Um, so we created um, things even like our own dictionary. So Edge Magic, for example, it, our, our own definition is it's colourful, it's curious, it's, it's innovative, 
we think outside the box, it's collaborative and just why not? Um, so we really tried to create something in a business that was completely different. Um, we had no, no guidelines and no rules and effectively we have made it up as we've gone along. Um, obviously, my business partner and I, Sarah, are, you know, obviously intelligent people, but we have no business background training. So we have followed our gut feeling and we've tried things. Um, I think some of the panel have talked about working with people and, and kind of different personalities. And we've chosen from the start that we only want to work with people that we like um, and we only want to have fun. And if it's not fun, then why are we, why are we doing it? So that's really, really important for us. Um, so we have, can you see the next slide? Not yet. Okay. No, on edge magic. It doesn't like me. I'm just going to um, reshare. Sorry. That's OK. <clears throat> right. Let's try again. I think it's um, Mac don't like full screen. <laughs> yeah, we're there. Great stuff. <laughs> Perfect. Oh. All right. Just good. I mean, trial and error is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Right. Here we go. Let's try this. Is that better? So Perfect. we have grown a team of nine ladies which is quite unusual in the construction industry so that we are 100 female at present we do not exclude men it's not by design it's just i think that um ladies in the industry have been attracted to to female directors um, we have a support team um who are our support superheroes and they sit just down here at the bottom one of whom is paul our it man and he is a man so just to put it out there we, we don't exclude men at all um, we very much believe and empower our team to understand and realise what their own strengths and weaknesses are, because that's really important. So I will openly admit to what my strengths are and my weaknesses too, because I think if we don't play to those strengths, then we're not giving our, ourselves and our full authentic self to a team. So I know, for example, that I am a, sp a space explorer. And that means for me that I want to go and explore things. I want to come up with ideas. I want to think of um, new new ideas, new schemes and new projects. I want to kind of go around the universe looking for new planets. Um, not everybody is like that because some people in the team prefer to be a rocket scientist. And that uh, tends to be the kind of team member who loves making sure that things work, um, that likes the detail, that likes to have a process, that likes to tick things off their list. The really, really important thing that I want all of our teams to understand is that neither one of those is better than the other and um, they are absolutely equal and every single team needs both of those in order to be successful and to thrive and um, so that's really important for everyone that's out there as well you don't have to be able to do everything um, you don't have to be a space explorer to run your own business you know you can be whatever you want to be as long as you're being yourself I think that's really really important um, and the other thing that's really important to us is that we leave the world a more interesting place for having been here you know so why are we doing what we're doing um you know as people said earlier about actually it was in the quotation that you had at the start glenn about um building roads you know we have to deal with concrete as well you know we're we're in the housing business but we want to make sure that we do that properly and that um we design everything to the best of our ability uh, so it's not just about uh, creating beautiful places but the ethos and the brand and the vibe of our business is very much all part of that story. Um, so I think if you allow yourselves to kind of be free, be yourself, then actually your passions and your personality shine through in, into business as well. I think everyone should be brave enough to embrace that. And I will stop talking. That's lovely. Thanks, Hannah. And, and I'm now very happy. I much better understand the name of your business, um, which just adds to its allure and, and excitement. So, yeah, let, let's come back to some of the points you've made in a little while as well. Um, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> Difficult acts to follow so far. In terms of the, I guess, where I started, uh, so I've been in local government, uh, so I'm, I'm truly an outsider in terms of some of the conversations. So I've been in local government for a over 20 years now, and I remember asking a question right when I started, What? how do I write a letter from a, I was a young graduate, I didn't really know what to do, how do I write a letter from this very austere organisation that I worked for, uh, an organisation that I wanted to be proud of instantly. Um, and I was handed this letter, and it was a very ornate, very articulate, very detailed letter, and it was signed, it was signed as your obedient servant. And I really struggled with that as a concept. I thought, hang on a second, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody's servant. I'm a young 
graduate and I've got all the ideas in the world and I kind of thought what was that context so I kind of unpacked it a little bit if I'm honest I ignored it as well I didn't really raise it as a query what does that mean is that is that how you sign all your letters in a local authority or is that just this individual didn't really question it and kicking myself ever since for not doing so I think for me part of that was starting to understand the role of, of, of what you do as a local authority officer and, and how you kind of conduct yourself and and the advice and guidance and and I have throughout my career been in many occasions whereby you're put under some pressure to uh, consider things how you articulate them and how you deal with things and one thing that that I was told and I think at this point you do need to look around you you do need to kind of get that view from those around you mentors coaches are really helpful but a mentor and I've had several over my career in in some of them I've agreed with and have been just on my wavelength and other ones the best ones are the ones that I really don't get on with uh, they're the ones that really push and and develop my thinking and, and my views of the world um, just because we think differently doesn't mean that they're not good people and they've got good views it's just the fact that they don't think like I do and respecting that is really important and one of the things I learned really quickly as part of that is um, being aggressively transparent in what we do. And that aggressive transparency is really quite clear. So you might be advising on something that you may have a problem with. You, you can't quite see how it stacks up, but your role is, is that part of it. Your role is being part of that picture and part of that solution. And that aggressive transparency and being able to offer the right advice, the right honesty in that, in that approach, being clear about what that, what that, angle will take what that what that view will take i've also always had the opportunity to uh, convert some of the projects and some of the initiatives and policies uh, into what they look like on the ground in front of communities trust me nothing more compelling than trying to unpack a policy you don't believe in and are quite aren't quite sure what its impact will be uh, to a local community i've been in small rooms with parish councils i've been in large rooms with large groups of people are on uh, largely unpopular projects, actually, and found myself in that place. If, if I don't believe it, trust me, the community finds you out really quickly. So again, understanding what those limitations are, actually, you're not there to promote in, in my world. What you're there to do is advise, show all the different issues that are there, being able to compel uh, what that overall vision is likely to be, but also all the idiosyncrasies with it, all the limitations with it. I've always found by being aggressively transparent in what we present and the limitations that are there, you get respect. You don't get agreement. But what you do is you get respect in how that's approached. I've also found in organisations, and I have worked for a, a couple, not many, but a couple, um, and where that transparency is not appreciated or respected, kind of time to move on, really, because that's not the organisation for me. And that's a really difficult decision. And I'm kind of with Sharon here on I need to pay those bills. So it's not exactly an easy decision. But equally, you need to be able to find a way through that and be really clear with those communities. So for me, particularly, that, that spectre of always having to think, I'm going to have to go out and, and really present this and understand it and, and be really compelling and, and authentic, want to a better expression in front of a community, means that regardless of what my organisation's view is, regardless of what working for, for councillors may do, and, it, and it's... I was fascinated by Hannah's statement of I, I, I get the opportunity to work with people that, that I like and people I want to work with. I work for councillors. That's why I work with people that are elected, um, whether I like them or not. Thankfully, I'm, I'm blessed with a, gr a good group of, of councillors that really work hard for their local communities. But for me, it's that always that compelling moment of how do you explain this? How do you explain this view, this opinion in that in that environment? And how do you walk out of that room with at least, even if they don't agree, with the view that you've given the absolute truth of what that issue is and being able to walk away with your head held high, you've given the best advice, regardless of what that decision is. And that's my final piece, actually, is just understanding what your influence and role is. If you think, and rightly so, you can solve word piece, brilliant, go for it. That's your call. I'm afraid I can't. What I can do is do a little bit of advice and a little bit of guidance on the particular area that I'm looking for understand in my view what I could influence uh, what I can play a role in and that for me is the way that which I've, I've been able to ba balance out all of those competing issues all of those competing concerns uh, and it gives me an opportunity then to be really clear and, and precise about where where my influence sits and where it doesn't thanks Glenn that's wonderful thanks Anne. um I love the phrase aggressively transparent because I as I 
listen and, and look at you you're the last person i would associate that we don't really know each other yet very well um as aggressive but i think what very what you've done very powerfully is highlight how that sense of of clarity and conviction putting yourself into what could feel a very vulnerable space actually gives you a sort of superpower of the sort hannah showed on her her slide so yeah a, a wonderful phrase there's some wonderful what other phrases here i'm scribbling down madly so um last but certainly not least sonia um, thanks for waiting, but we've had such a richness of insight from the other panellists, and I know you won't disappoint either, so over to you. Oh, wow. It's a big set up there, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am inc feel incre incredibly privileged to be part of um, such an incredible panel of people, um, coming away feeling inspired already. Um, so I'm Chief Exec of Women in Transport. It's a professional network that supports professional development of women working in the transport sector, and it's open to everyone. Um, and you know, it, it, it's a hugely privileged position because it's a role that is more than just a job. It's a passion. It's where I feel empowered and that I belong and um, I'm safe um I'm supported and and that that's an incredible feeling and I would hope that everybody can find that in their career um because it's it's an incredible feeling and um and it's somewhere where my values my purpose my passion have really aligned but you know, my career has been um over 20 years so far so it's definitely um, been a journey to get here. I've had what I would like to describe as a beautifully squiggly career. I was once a transport planner, very early career, um, and I've mentioned more than once um, of the people that I've ha had at one point 10 different jobs over 10 years, um, which makes me sound incredibly unreliable, I realise, but um, actually not in all different companies. But I think the challenge that I had is that I am both a space explorer and a rocket scientist, which is a challenge, right? So how do you find where you fit in that and, and where you belong? And when you're always challenging, you're always looking for a challenge, you're always trying to make a difference um, and you're always pushing, really. And there's been lots of times in my career where um, I've had tremendous support, brilliant managers. Uh, equally, there have been times where I felt like I don't quite belong here. Um, things that I'm doing or the values that um, I'm being asked to display or the things, the projects that I'm being asked to do don't fit with my values. And so then I've had to have, make really tough decisions about where do I go next? What's right for me? What do I want to do? And that sometimes meant taking a pay cut and taking a step down or taking a step sideways. And, you know, that's not right for everybody. Going back to Sharon's point, you know, that, that there is the reality of paying bills. I, I bought a house when I was 23. And, you know, as a single person trying to, there's the reality of keeping a roof over your head and making those decisions. And what I will say is that if you're, if you're in that place and you're struggling, add to all the other questions that um, we've posed to you today, what matters to you? What's right for you in this moment? And it will be different at any given moment because our lives evolve and change and there are different priorities at any given time. And that will influence our decisions. And just because you make a decision right now, maybe two years later, you can make a different decision. Um, and where do you want to spend your energy? You get one mind, and one body and your mental health and your well-being is should be the top priority that you have because you'll work for a long time and there are the various ways to work and there are various ways to make money um but there's only one you and you really matter so how do you want to spend your energy and your time and where do you want to be and that will, I think, help guide your career and help you find somewhere where your purpose, your passion, your values do align. Wonderful. Thanks, Sonia. 
I've been sat here with a mounting sense of trepidation. Can I be aggressively transparent when I don't know where to start with how to follow up with questions in the, the mere 45 minutes that we have left? Because I think you've just given us such a rich seam of, of insight, advice, um, heart on your sleeves, uh, sharing of your experiences. And I hope the audience is, is sat out there really having had some value just from listening to a collection of people who've had very different journeys to come to today's session. Um, but you can sense a lot of synergy between their advice and experience, which I encourage you to, to take stock from as giving you confidence that what they're saying is really worth um, you know, embodying in your own decisions that you make. And I, I would just like to ask, we haven't tried this before, so nobody may engage um, in YouTube at all, and we'll see afterwards whether it works. Um, but you're all able to make a comment in the chat bar in YouTube, of course. Um, I'd just like to ask each of you to answer this question and with an explanation briefly. Would you like to work in a team that was made up of the people you're looking at uh, on the screen at the moment? Um, and you can be your authentic selves in answering that question. Um, if it's too much of a love-in, you can tell us that you want to be in a different type of team. Um, if you've been feeling uncomfortable and this is giving you a sense of inspiration and hope, and you'd love if this team existed, and I'm, this isn't about us all joining Edge, by the way, at the end of the, of the, of the event necessarily, but just have, answer that question. Would you like to work for a team like this you're seeing on the screen and why? And I think it would be great just afterwards for us to have a record of that on YouTube of, of what your feelings are having listened to this um, amazing panel. Uh, also, I'm very pleased to know that in the audience we have, um, I can say a hero of mine, Georgia Yexley. Um, hi, Georgia, great that you're out there. Um, and you've been an inspiration for me, as I hope you know. Uh, you have had your own journey and also you've been a wonderful upstander for the importance of being your authentic self. And I know you'd asked us before um, the event if um, we could point the way to uh, resources and people that others can draw upon. Um, I hope the introductions just from our panel have given you a large part of the answer um, to that question or request. But um, what I will do is ask our panelists after the event if, if they have any more direct resources in terms of web pages or books or or um, other sources to share those with me and I can put those uh, into the write up from the event. Um, the one of the things I wanted to ask across all your experiences was um, a sense of how easy this has all been, because I can imagine there are some earlier career people in the audience, particularly, but maybe some older career people who are saying, well, that seems fine. You seem to be strong, confident people. Um, is, has it been a sense of good fortune, good luck? Um, it seems as though you know exactly what you should do at each turn, but I'm sure it can't have always been the case and you're bearing some scars and it may be uncomfortable for you to want to share some of that. But um, I think, was it you, Alan, that said the, your, the mentors that perhaps most inspired you were the ones that you disagreed with? And um, I know that many metalheads looking at the screen behind where I'm sat um, are in that crowd of, of like mindedness because they've been victims and they've been bullied uh, and they've had to learn about themselves in a world that doesn't understand them um, and find their way. So I wondered if on the panel there's some, some insights you can share about the challenges and perhaps circumstances that have guided you or caused you to walk away or step up. Um, Hannah, I'm seeing you nodding vigorously to start with. Would you like to yeah, go first? I'll go for it. <clears throat> yeah, I'll be utterly vulnerable here. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm absolutely an overworker because I'm extremely passionate about what I do. And so in the jobs I've had, um, particularly working in London, I threw myself into them with literally everything and probably too much. Um, the outcome of that was that I gave myself um, panic disorder and anxiety. And um, I got to the point where it affected my mental health um, and, and I was utterly broken. Um, so I, I kind of left my job and, and quit and went and volunteered on a farm for two years to um, uh, just to kind of draw back from that process. And it's definitely been the adversity and um, the bullies that I've met and the scars that I have 
that have stopped me caring about what, what, what people think about me and allowed me to kind of release myself, if that makes sense. So if I hadn't have had the adversity or the scars, I don't think I would be where I am today. So I think it's, I mean, it's very hard to think that far ahead if you're sat in that point in time at the moment, but you know, there is always a, the next day and it does get better. So I think you just have to trust the process and the journey. Thank you, Hannah. And I'm just seeing some, some comments that we're getting snippets from uh, in the audience. And, and someone has said, KL has just said, it's been encouraging to feel like I'm not alone. And I think you've probably just given everyone a, a sort of deep filling up of their um, vessel of water, if you like, um, rather than know it's been an encouragement to, to be authentic. Um, who else on the panel might feel they've got um, a story to share? Alan? I think um, for me, almost acknowledging that vulnerability is really hard, but it, it's kind of worth doing. And I, it's something that I, I, I've i failed at on many occasions, but actually getting into the conversation and, and starting to open up to that vulnerability. And I remember occasion um, uh, only a couple of years ago, walking in, into, into one of those community environments I, I described and basically admitting I, I really wasn't confident about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And I needed some help and support from those in the room to kind of lead me through that and, and provide that. I think even admitting that was incredibly helpful because it then starts to, you, you, you garner an instant team approach around you. You garner that, that support that you need and also that recognition that you haven't got all the answers, but and that's okay. You're kind of working that through and, and actually being really honest about that helps kind of build that understanding and and equally but also recognizing the fact that you're quite nervous about something or you've got that anxiety before you go into that space being honest about that and, and also being confident enough to sort of verbalize that is quite useful as well in those occasions um sometimes uh, and i've been in those public inquiry environments too where that's not what what people want from you they want that kind of stoic professional that doesn't blink and, and doesn't I'm afraid I'm not that and I wanted to kind of deliver that with passion and as a result of that I think that's where you get that more respect but by being honest and stepping into that space is really useful my mentors have always tried to encourage that as well but as part of that you know, that, that tension I quite like uh, but being open and honest right from the start of what your limitations are going to be yeah. it's difficult but it, it puts you on the right path and, and just segueing from that back to you Paul because I think you, you made a very powerful point, which is that we need to know our authentic selves before we can really fulfill the values of becoming more authentic and the perhaps the, the sense of superpower we can get from that in making our way. Um, do you have any set insights and anonymized experiences, if you want, of where people or even yourself, by not being fully authentic, you know, it's been problematic? Or not, sorry, rather not knowing your authentic self well enough, even if you're you're trying to follow this course. Oh, oh yes. And um, so thank you very much for that, Glenn. I always, maybe I'm often overcoming about who I am, uh, which has helped me and, uh, and allowed me to travel several times. And one thing I want to say is that sometimes you have to speak. Sometimes you have to actually verbalize your concern. You know, one thing I've discovered or I know is that bosses are also masquerade. They pretend to be to know it all, but they actually don't know it all. And in their heart of hearts, they're actually looking for people to help. Okay, to solve problems and to solve organizational difficulties. Of course, they are in their big offices, and so you go there as the lead one. So one thing which I've done, I discovered that, not that I say my sister didn't know anything, I wasn't that rude, but I knew that they were just humans like me, okay? And that if I read and I can help them, they respond to me. So I normally use You've been able to help my boss and all this. At one time, I had a difficulty. I'm out in a university, and I was heading a research center. And I thought that I should become a leader. 
a reader in the university is like today is next to being a professor. And so I went to my health department and said, look at how beautiful my CV is. Look, I've written an application. I think I should be promoted. The guy just saw it right in front of me, put it in the bin. And I was shocked. Several things came to my brain. I know, what is this? You're supposed to support me. And I was expecting you to support me and put my application to the dean. Say, hello, we have ratio one to four here, one professor to four lecturers, and we are full. Nothing, no space for you, Paul. Okay, so, and I said, okay, so what do I need to become a reader? Okay, then without me knowing that I was training and I, I don't want to, I don't, don't use this anybody. I said, what do I need to, if the ratio is one to four, first, where did the ratio one to four came from? Okay, who devised, why can it not one professor to five lecturers? Where did you get that from? Now, if I have this CV, do I have to kill somebody before I can get to become a professor? I left the office very angry. Then I went back. And then I went back to my room. The five minutes after the dean came to me and said, Paul, I learned you told the head of the department that you want to kill somebody. I said, no, that's not what I said. Okay, I said the ratio one to four, one to five is unreasonable. Where did you get from? If I qualify to this, so there are some systemic chains that need to be broken. Okay, I didn't, I, I didn't know when it came out of my mouth that should kill you. Should I like kill somebody before? I didn't, and I will not recommend that. But sometimes what I'm saying is that sometimes you have to speak up especially when you have no other way to go. If you leave it, nothing will happen. Another person will come and suffer the same thing you have suffered. So please listen. Sometimes you got to speak, especially when you get to some roadblocks which you cannot explain, okay? But that was 20 years ago. I've learned that I could influence, I can cuddle, I can beg, I can do this. But why should I have to do that if I want to be myself? Okay, if I want to be myself, if I want to be respected for who I am, I don't want to owe anybody any favors. I don't want anybody to owe me any favors. I just want my organization to be the best it can be. But one thing I would say, sometimes you have to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's another another wonderful story. Well, wonderful in the sense of uh, what we learn from it. Um, and actually, because uh, I had in my sights a question from Red Rebel uh, in the audience, and, and I hope Red Rebel, you've you've got something of an answer to your question, at least from one of one of our number on screen. Red Rebel asks. Um, in an ethical context, the CAO wants to adopt a policy leading to harmful outcomes for the wider community. Would they, meaning us, resign, accept or fight? Um, well, of course, we could all go to edge, um, assuming we're not in edge already. I can't believe that would happen, Hannah. Um, but I think Paul has illustrated very beautifully and powerfully. Um, there are moments you pick where you go outside your comfort zone. And I want to come to, to Lynn and perhaps well, Lynn, Sonia and Sharon, you may all want to react, but um, I did love your uh, your phrase, Hannah, um, a comfort zone is a wonderful place where nothing ever grows. Um, and I wonder, Lynn, starting with you, uh, do you have an example where you've you've managed to grow as a person by stepping out your comfort zone and, and taking a risk and learning from it? Um, yes, lots of lots of times actually. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say that I haven't always been as authentic as I appear today. Um, certainly early in my career, I was very career, um, you know, I, I was very sort of passionate about the career, wanting to advance, wanting to influence, etc. And, um, and I don't think I always acted 
in the most authentic way. But I, I learned from when I wasn't authentic or when I was trying to fulfill a role that I, um, you know, that I wasn't really, um, the company wasn't and I weren't suited for each other. Um, to the effect that actually um, I was, you know, I was with, with one company, and this is the lesson really that I'd, I'd say to people, where I was um, trying to, well, I was, I was fulfill a role commercially and technically uh, that the chairman wanted me to do, um, and then, uh, and this meant, you know, uh, working really long hours, really, um, really sort of committing everything uh, to myself, but not necessarily my beliefs. And um, and it made me ill. Uh, it made me very ill. And um, and it was a shock, really, because I thought I was indestructible. And um, and I and I had a choice then. Uh, as my consultant said to me, Lynn, you have got a choice. You can carry on and be dead, or you can change the way you are. And um, so I changed the way I was. And I, I then realized that my authentic, you know, being myself and, and giving my values um, to people in a, in a reasonable way um, actually meant a lot to people. And commercially, it meant a lot as well. And people wanted to work with me because they felt um, comforted and confident that I would actually help them get to where they want to be. Um, and so that was sort of a big big wake up call for me but also realizing that being me was just fine yeah thanks Lynn and, and I was starting to think as you talked there about co-benefits really I suppose in that you know this is not only something that helps you out of a toxic situation but actually immediately starts to deliver positives that you perhaps hadn't expected that build upon that um and Sonia come, perhaps coming to you because I know you mentioned um in your introduction you know sometimes it's been about a pay cut or you know stepping away from an opportunity because your value set you know points you in a direction that is still fulfilling is, is there something you can share on in, in that respect yeah so I mean it's actually I haven't a couple of times in my crib I'll, I'll talk about one I think we'll pick up on a couple of the questions that people have asked as well so I was working in um, a small consultancy um and I just I found that um, what I what I thought the organisation's values were and the leadership values were just weren't what I'd always thought they were. I, I'd, I'd known the company um, prior to joining it um, as an external person, and um, it's interesting when you get inside somewhere and and seeing <laughs> what the reality might be like. So whilst I was able to do um, a really good job and, and uh, like Hannah, one of those overworkers, <laughs> it gives my energy and my time um, sort of unabashedly, if you like, um, and was a good manager, I think, to my team, I um, got to a place where I was making myself really unwell um, because my values did not align with the, um, the senior leader. And I was being asked to do things that I didn't feel were authentic and um, really experiencing lots of microaggressions um, on a daily basis. And so I took, uh, I see somebody said, you know, we, we all seem very confident, but that it, you know, that confidence is hard won. So I took a really difficult decision because um, I'd got to the point where I was literally every night going home crying and try to drag myself up the stairs and people will know that that is just not me that's not my personality normally and um I I left that job with nothing to go to nothing at all uh with no real safety net I had um some money from a, a previous redundancy um which you know was sort of a little bit of a um a rainy day fund um and I, I had a holiday book so I went on that holiday and I um, had a life-changing conversation with somebody I'd met through Women in Transport um a coach called Shona Oran she has a brilliant podcast called The Psychology of Successful Women and so I really recommend that um you know anybody who's struggling listens to that because it's full of positive energy and inspiration and wonderful stories 
And um, she and my then boyfriend said, you talk about women in transport so passionately. And I'd been a volunteer for quite a long time at that point. Why don't you make that your career? I was like, hmm, what do you mean? It doesn't exist. There isn't a, like, a paid role in women in transport. Like, but why couldn't there be? And so I uh, took my space explorer <laughs> uh, persona on and came back, wrote a proposal about how that might work. And my rocket scientist bit was like the details. Like, how is that going to actually um, work out? And how am I going to finance this? And how would um, this work? And how would I cover my bills? I went to the board. I proposed this role of paid chief exec as an interim role and um you know then if it worked out to become more permanent and that was the end of 2018 I became chief exec in 2019 and I'm still here today so um you know it does I think you know you can take long terms and you can learn from them and um just because you find yourself in a position where things feel like they're spiraling out of control, it doesn't mean you can't take control back. And it can be really empowering when you um, find that light bulb for you. Thanks ever so much, Sonia, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I know you've dug deep um, to, to give us that story. Um, Sharon, I'd like to come to you. So we've sort of moved around the group with these sorts of um, sharings. And then I'd, I'd like to come back to a different topic. But um, what... I'm sure all sorts of thoughts have been firing in your mind and you've been working out which one to home in on, uh, to, to, to comment on. Would you like to share something with us? Yeah, I mean, I think it took me a, a very long time to be confident in being me. And I can certainly remember spending a long time in my early career trying to work out in my head really mechanically how I should react in a situation. And was it me that didn't understand the situation or was there a rule that I didn't get that was somewhere written that other people got so I think I think a lot like the others I spent way too long trying to work out almost what was wrong with me and how to fit in um and I just wasn't I just didn't feel confident I mean you know as a young female engineer particularly I didn't feel confident having those conversations to sort of say, can you just explain that? What is it you want from me? So I, I, I definitely stayed a few places way too long where I should have left. Often out of a feeling of um, I should, I must, duty, whatever that was misplaced. And it's taken me a long time to realise, actually after, after being in a job that I probably should have gone because it wasn't working out. And then they just turn around and go, by the way, we don't need you. It wasn't quite like that. But I think if you know it's a wrong fit, you should do something about it. But having that confidence, like Sonia says, and working out what you can do about it. And I think I'm probably still very overly sensitive. And I always need feel the need to have at least, well, I'm doing that. Then I must have a backup plan and a backup plan to the backup plan. I mean, I absolutely love, I would like to say to any colleagues listening, I really love my job at CILT and I am not <laughs> intending to leave. I'm referring to previous <laughs> incarnations. Um, but I think I definitely found myself over planning and overthinking. And I think if there'd just been another idiot like me around that could have said, no, 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 you're fine. Nobody knows the rules and everybody's winging it a bit. I would have felt much better. But when you're in your 20s and your 30s, you, you do just, the world is just around you. And you, you, yeah, it's very, very hard to see outside and to make that leap. And somebody did say in the chat, it is very difficult at the early stages of your career to be that authentic person um, just because you haven't got the life experience and everyone's got some scars. And I think, Hannah, you were saying, by the time you've got 17 scars, the 18th doesn't hurt. So it's not really helping, but it's just my journey. But I definitely spent way too much of my life trying to second guess what other people thought. And yeah. I wish I hadn't. And I'd just like to join one or two of the dots together because I think Sharon it was you that said um or, or intimated that you know you're only too pleased to pass on your uh, your experience and advice to others to earlier career professionals and I remember um former um boss of the organization that that I'm in saying um what earlier career people need to appreciate is that most 
older professionals are only too delighted to be approached and asked to, to help you. And I appreciate you have to decide whether those are Alan's mentors he's going to learn from choosing not to be like them or from being like them. But um, I hope, you know, where people are hearing today, several of you being very, um, very vulnerable, really, and sharing some of the pain that you've been through, that if people in the audience feeling that, um, part of what we've been hearing today is how valuable it is to talk with others um, and, sh and open up a bit of ourselves and share um, and learn from each other. Um, the thought did also occur to me, and I must mention this um, without wishing to embarrass Paul, but he, he has been um, my boss, mentor and friend for 10 years um, and many bits of advice he's given me. But one of the phrases he used quite recently was, Glenn, I think the role you have now optimises you. Um, and it might make me sound like a rocket scientist, but actually he's made me a space explorer or helped me to become a space explorer. Um, and it is that that guidance that we get along the way that matters so much. Um, our time is, you know, we've plenty of minutes left. And what I would like to come to, partly coming back to our um, anonymous secret transport planner, um, reminding us, those of us in the transport sector particularly, but I'm sure it's not just the transport sector, it feels like we're in very difficult territory now. We're in a, a world beyond the pandemic hitting us hard. Um, there's economic stresses and strains, cost of living problems. There's the enormity of the climate emergency, which is all of which are affecting us personally, but also affecting the professional world we exist in, where what once might have been the right thing to do, and I mentioned the Wales Roads Review, um, there may well be some highway engineers listening to this call, wondering where their future lies. Um, there may be some transport planners who still are expected to contribute to new infrastructure that is massively carbon intensive. So my question really to you as a panel is, do you think the state of play at the moment um, makes for it being even more difficult to be our authentic selves at work? Or alternatively, is there something a, a dynamic now being created um, that we can capitalise on and help each other more uh, in our authenticity? Um, Hannah, you're in the middle of my screen, so can I pick on you first, if you don't mind? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it's difficult for me to comment on some of that because I'm not in the transport industry, but what I would say in response to your question is, I think we all have a responsibility as professionals um, to, you know, to help with the, the climate, financial, all of the crises that we face, you know, food emergencies. Um, and actually, I... I personally would say that's a great opportunity for those who are young in their career, because perhaps you see something in a different way to somebody who's later in their career. You know, you, you've all got something to bring that's really special and unique to yourself, whether you realise it or not. So I would just encourage everybody to see that as an opportunity to try new things or um, explore different ways of doing things or learn from other professionals um, and kind of expand your network that way. Um, so I can't comment on the transport side of things, but hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And well, Sonia, uh, as as women in transport, you're in transport by definition. Um, what what have you made of the last three years? If you do you come across members who are struggling more, who are feeling more empowered because th there's a chance for change, they can uh, be, be more vocal around. What's your sense of the state of play? Um, I think. Um, for me, it seems like there's so there's more opportunity to be honest and, and push for change. And um, like platforms and visibility to um, to have a voice. And it's I think it's good to see things like um, it's the um, unconference and things like that that have like, opportunities where we're engaging in different ways around these topics and opening up for those, as Hannah said, you know, being open to those new ideas and that younger generation coming through who are disruptive and um, are challenging the status quo. So that's what I said. What I think is exciting is that is seeing that new generation of women in transport coming through and just ha not having necessarily, whilst 
Probably, there are still barriers, absolutely. There are still barriers and we, we still have a long way to come. But they don't perceive the same barriers necessarily. And I think that's really good for them. That means that um, it feels to them like they can challenge much more openly. Um, and, you know, we're in, we're in a position where we can help them do that. And um, building upon that, Alan, you're, you're in the public sector. Um, and you've mentioned, you know, in a sense, you've got officers and politicians, councillors and so on, uh, all of whom are facing these challenges. Um, do you feel that the earlier career colleagues around you who are developing through um, are being more aggressively transparent? Do you, do you sense they've got the opportunity to follow your lead and do that? Or are there some real tensions at play that people have to tread carefully within? I think for me, uh, it's... Um... I don't think we're doing enough, to be quite honest. I don't think I'm doing enough. We're doing enough collectively to encourage uh, those that are coming through earlier around some of that critical questioning and, and how to do that. Uh, it's really interesting that the dynamic of kind of constructive challenge and engagement is one that's really difficult to learn. Um, but actually, it's, it is a skill. And I think what we do is we spend way too much time focusing on those kind of tick box style skills and, and less about the types of conversations that people need to have to be able to deal with that. So, I, for instance, I met with a group of graduates this morning describing what we're up to at the moment and their opportunity as part of being a new authority. And I was really disappointed at the level of questioning that I got. Um, the reason I'm disappointed is not for them, from the individuals, but from the fact that we didn't do enough with them to get them into that place of being able to critically challenge so I made some really bold statements and, and really sold out what I thought was a vision and I can imagine being on the other end of that in their heads going no I don't believe what he just said I'm not so sure about that because I'm not sure what I'm doing day one I'm not really sure where I'm reporting and who my manager is going to be but we didn't give them the confidence we haven't done the work with those individuals to kind of help and constructively challenge so for me I think that's one of the things that we've got to do better collectively i think it, that constructive engagement that constructive challenge it's okay to doubt it's okay to ask a question you're not you're not questioning that individual to the point that you don't believe them it's more over you're helping your understanding yeah. regrettably we're still in that place where you have to caveat and preface those types of questions at the moment because they're they're seen as being challenging or difficult i'd like to move past the point where you know a, a, a younger member of the team feels like they have to or someone that's not been with the organization has to do that prefacing i find that i have to preface everything i say at the moment just to work into that space to give me the confidence to get to that and i it's regrettable that we don't have that in some of the young people that are coming through or those that aren't new sorry those that are new to the organization so that would be my big ambition remove the prefacing of why you're asking the question just ask the bloody question so that i mean that paul look out because i'm coming back in your direction but um it, it compels me to ask paul a, a very big challenging question which is that that speaking to education what alan's just said um how are you seeing the way we and other universities are operating in terms of um, encouraging and developing the skills within our students to, to be those people who challenge without preface in a constructive way um, and share their views. Do you sense any, any development there, any change, any difficulty? Uh, I think the whole pandemic has disrupted all of us. And it's, dis it's disrupted the way we are actually delivering university education. One of the main areas that is very popular here now is apprenticeship, in which so you find that not many people want to pay the tuition fees for the next 20, 30 years. So you have high demand for apprentices. And with a big pressure from us from the industry say look this is what we want our graduates to be well, there was a survey which we've just done in uh, in bristol of the 21 22 largest organization in bristol and it, it was done amongst the hr directors and the finding was about was very clearly we have onboarding issues in most of the large companies here in Bristol. You spend 10,000, 20,000 pounds to look for somebody, okay? 
you get the person and then you threaten person if you don't pass your probation, I'm going to sack you in six months. Okay, in a very expensive city. The whole onboarding approach to the new generation is just not there. And we as an institution, we have we need to work within that space with the companies who have now and who have now identified this as a problem as a big massive problem because we haven't got enough people to work. We have vacancies all over every company, every NHS, everything here in Bristol, we have lots of vacancies. So how do we actually start proactive onboarding framework schemes in the large employers here? I think it's a big problem. Now, I have to then look then from some of the uh, comments on the chat, okay, about leadership training, okay, in which the leader or a boss in the industry or in the company is not just this bossy boss, okay, it's actually somebody who wants you to do well, who onboard you well, who want to sign you up to the vision of the company and want to make profit for the company to make profit and for you to have a good well-being. Now, one thing which we have seen from the new generation is that whether it is the whether it is the COVID, whether it is something, they know what they want to do. These are not a generation that want to work seven days a week. No, they they are more concerned about their well-being. How do we pull that one into the great programs? How do we pull that one into the way they are onboarded into the different companies? Huge issue for us. And I think that if we do the onboarding well, the issue about authenticity, graduates being confident to go into the space, knowing they are welcome, knowing that they are wanted, knowing that they are appreciated, uh, will become reality, but it's going to take a lot of training on both sides, right from the education side and also from uh, from industry side. Thanks, Paul. Um, and Sharon, can I, there's a theme coming through in the sense of an intergenerational theme, quite understandably. So someone said in the audience, you know, in a sense, let's not put all the weight on the next generation's shoulders to be the authentic change makers. Um, at the very least, the more senior people need to be helping pave the way for that and, and give them the confidence. Um, from a membership organisation, do you get the opportunity to get some sense of whether or not we're seeing as much as we should expect from the more senior people across organisations, public and private, in terms of supporting that encouragement of authenticity at all levels? Um, before we go, though, just, I did have a thought while people were speaking, sorry. Yeah, well, go I, ahead. It's a really good recognition that we're, we, we are so aware of climate change and the climate emergency. And I think we do actually have the younger generation to thank for that. Somebody put in the comments that younger people are so much clearer about their values. So I think we're definitely seeing a lot of change that younger people have brought about. Um, and that is encouraging. And I would say probably the climate change agenda is the greatest. But um, are, are older people doing enough? Um, I think it's hard to say. We've got a lot of really good people who are out there waving the flag, encouraging diversity. I mean, if I can just name check, we're doing generation logistics at the moment, which has been supported across the industry. And we've got a hundred. Oh, logistics oh, ambassadors. There we are. Sorry, Sarah, and they're not all under 30. We have. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Dod dodgy internet connection. Um, when, did, when did you lose me? Um, just just rewind only about 30 seconds. You're talking about your new initiative. Yeah, so what I was saying about Generation Logistics, which is a campaign funded by DFT, Logistics UK ourselves, and a lot of industry bodies, is we're trying to sort of promote the industry as a whole as being an exciting and diverse place. And as part of that, we've got Generation Logistics ambassadors. And I was saying they're not all under 30. We've got a number of older professionals who are really keen to get out there and support. We've also got the next generation. So there's a lot of people who are really passionate about it and are going out there and trying to share and bring their knowledge. Um, I think some of the issues are, it, it's almost the OK Boomer thing. 
if I tell my 16 year old who's upstairs something, I am fundamentally wrong and know nothing. So I think it's a way of making it relevant and appealing. And I'm not telling you, it's a two way conversation. And if I'm going to explain something to you, um, I, I'd love to do some reverse mentoring and I've talked about it with colleagues. I'd really like to understand what it is that younger people want out of a job. We make massive assumptions, but we don't know what that is. So I'd like them really to tell me, how do I make it a job that's appealing and attractive to you and that you feel valued in, even though sometimes it may be a bit mundane. So it's a two way communication, I think. That's wonderful. Um, Hannah, just a moment. I, I want to bring bring Lynn in just in terms of the, the broad question of, you know, does it feel now? I know you're, you know, we're all at, at the career stage we're at um, mm. and the age we're at. But does it feel the environment at the moment different and more I encouraging or discouraging in terms of people being their true selves? Um, well, I, I was agreeing with one of the comments that um, is in the chat that young people, um, let's call them, you know, uh, early professionals have um, new ideas and stronger beliefs. And, um, and I think it's whether it's to do with carbon, whether it's to do with road building, um, you know, whatever um, sort of you know, emergency is arising, it's about... Um, to me, it's about letting those um, people have their voice and it's it's about making them feel confident to, to speak out um, because, you know, uh, a lot of the time there is this, oh, well, I can't possibly know as much as that person because they've been in the workplace much more, uh, much longer than me. And it's, it's clearly not the case. Um, so for me... Uh, it's not just about now, it's about, you know, it's about times gone by and in the future, letting people, like uh, acknowledging as, you know, leaders or team leaders or, you know, anybody that you're mentoring, etc., that you have the power to speak out. These people have the power to speak out. And for me, it's about protecting the health of the, the profession. It's about protecting the strength of the profession profession this isn't just about leading the charge against particular issues at the moment it's about making um you know people's careers uh, feel fulfilled and um thoroughly enjoyable and still wanting to get out of bed you know every day to to do what you love in the workplace so to me it's I don't think it's any different now, Glenn, than it was in the past. I think we've just got to, we've got to support um, younger professionals and mid-career people as well that actually, you know, um, your views actually do count. So please, you know, we're not censoring you. You've got to speak out. Thanks, Lynn. Um, the grains of sand, the last few are running through the hourglass, but Hannah, you wanted to come in briefly, I think. I think um, just very quickly to back to kind of Sharon and Lynn and the points they've made. It, I believe it is the responsibility of all of us as leaders at whatever stage we are in our career. Um, undoubtedly, we will probably um, lead in somebody um, to ask that, those questions and not wait for people to come to us with them. I think we really should be having a two way conversation about what are your needs um, you know, in your job and in your career? What are your values and how can we work together? Um, in order to you know collaborate and make the most out of it because it should be a win-win in both directions businesses need young people to come through all the time and they need to know what their needs are and what their values are and what they need for their own well-being because the business will never grow without that great thanks Hannah and we're we're into our last two minutes so um, I'm afraid we don't have time to go around for the kind of last salvo of wisdom or, or takeaway from each panel member. Um, but I just wanted to pick out what really struck me very nice at the end. Sharon, was your mention of reverse mentoring. Um, it, it's instinctively hugely appealing. Practically, of course, there are some challenges there because there has to be a, a level of trust um, in the mentoring relationship for that to happen. But I'm also reminded of um, the double SWOT methodology that some people may have come across where you do a SWOT, first of all, within your team, which might be the senior team if you haven't got that um, inclusive and diverse uh, attitude within the workplace, but actually going and asking. And it could be going and asking 
um, a, a different um, demographic profile within the organization. When you look at the bosses and the organization, what's your SWOT analysis? And by bringing them together, it, the vulnerability of having a one-on-one -on -one, um, situation with a senior um, who may be more closed is taken away, um, but you do get that sort of collective voice um, of authenticity invited forwards. But sadly, our 90 minutes together um, have now all gone. Um, I apologise to the audience, we haven't been able to do justice to all of the um, engagement you've been making uh, in at YouTube, but really grateful you've joined. I hope you've learned a lot and found it worthwhile. Um, incredibly grateful to our panel. You've been absolutely authentic uh, and very generous um, with your experience and advice. So thank you all so much. And we will see you for the next Fireside Chat sometime soon. Brogan, back to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much.